Welcome to Park Media. I'm your host today, Vince Emanuele, and we're joined by Bill Fletcher, who is a talk show host, writer, activist, and trade unionist. He is the executive editor of The Global African Worker and also the author of They're Bankrupting Us, 20 Other Myths About Unions. You could follow him on Twitter, Facebook, and at BillFletcherJr.com. Bill, welcome back. I'm glad to be on. Thanks, thanks again for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, several things have happened since the last time we spoke. I feel like it probably makes sense to jump right into the uh, nomination of Kamala Harris as vice presidential candidate for the Democratic ticket. This week is kicking off the Democratic Party's national co- convention uh, in a rather unconventional way. But, you know, under the circumstances, it is what it is. And I'm wondering what you made of the announcement, if you were surprised by it. You know, we... I'm sure both got the same kind of responses from people, everything from people who are totally excited to people who are, you know, very upset to people who are sort of indifferent. I'm wondering both how you're processing it and how you're talking to other folks about, um, you know, the nomination of Kamala Harris and and how to move forward with the election. So um, I wasn't surprised. Um, I think that, uh, she is not a bad choice. Uh, she doesn't have my politics. Um, I uh, have, you know, several areas where I have significant disagreements with her. Um, but I think that we have to look at her choice. We have to, we have to look at a few factors. So one thing is Biden, I think, correctly decided and announced that he wanted a woman as his running mate. I thought that was very, very important. And and I think it's a tribute to the movement that has pushed him and uh, the women's movement and other movements that have been pushing to break the glass ceiling. So I thought that that was good. I think that he was also under a certain amount of pressure that it was a woman of color and and particularly a black woman because basically black people saved him, saved his candidacy. I mean, that's the reality. Um, And, and so I think in, in, on those levels, uh, it was very understandable plus generationally. So for example, when I think about the person whose politics I would have preferred, it would have been um, Senator Warren. Um, but generationally, it wouldn't have worked. It just simply wouldn't have worked. Uh, I think that the symbolism of a transgenerational uh, slate is very important. Um, I think that many people, uh, at a minimum, assume that Biden will only go one term, but are worried about his age and what that might mean. Uh, So I think that for a number of reasons, it was um, a very understandable choice. Now, um, you know, were there more progressive candidates? Absolutely. Uh, Stacey Abrams, for example, um, Karen Bass. But I would prefer, frankly, seeing Karen Bass remain in Congress or in the Senate. Uh, I very much, I was very worried to tell you, Vince, when her name was being floated, that this was, um, that this would actually fall into the hands of the Trump campaign, that they would make use of that, particularly in Florida. But here's the other part, and this is uh, not a criticism. Karen um, has positioned herself in a certain way that let's say is different from AOC. Um, And I worried, and I think we saw evidence of this, that when she started being attacked from the right, she started backing up. We don't need that. We, we, We just don't need that. So I think that Karen has done a very good job in Congress. And I think I'm hoping that she continues to do so. There are other candidates, but I, 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 I'm not really focused on it. I think all things considered, is it, it is what it is. It reflects a certain balance of power that exists within the Democratic Party. And 
The most important thing, Vincent, is this. If Biden and Harris are elected, there can be no honeymoon period. None. Nada. One of the biggest, most tragic mistakes that liberals and progressives made when Obama and Biden were elected was this idea of a honeymoon period. And, and there was this excusing away of different kinds of backsliding that happened in the first six months of the administration on the basis of, you got to give the brother a chance, give him some time. He's up against a lot. Our attitude right now is there is no time. There is no, there's no retreat. It's going forward. And the left's in a much better position today than it was in 2008. I mean, in fact, right before we got, we jumped on this interview, I was having a conversation with a friend who I'm still trying to hammer it home to him that he's not culpable for everything that happens if he votes Democratic. You know, he's sort of one of these cats who's not ideological, working class white dude from Northwest Indiana, understands that things are all fucked up, knows how bad the Trump administration is, didn't support him last time, but is one of those guys who maybe will vote, maybe won't vote. You know, his questions to me are like, I'm sure some of the same things you hear, like if I vote for the Democrats, am I then responsible for everything they do morally, ethically, all these types of things? I I mean, of course, I don't buy into that. I know you don't. Um, I'm wondering. Let's let's, let's just take that for one second. There's something that I think is very important for your friend to keep in mind and other people. There is this sort of illusion that many progressives have, that if we only had an independent people's party or workers party or whatever, that we would be off to the land of milk and honey. Now, what I want to encourage everyone to do is to do a little Googling. I want them to look at elections in multi-party countries where you have labor parties or left parties. And look for the following. In in how many of those cases outside of a revolution was the left able to win by itself? You will find very rarely, usually there is some sort of coalition. And for better or for worse, there's a coalition. We have to look at the Democratic Party as not a political party, but as a block, as a coalition. And what we've got to do is build up our forces. So I would say to your friend, no, you can't take responsibility to me for the uh, idiocy that happens, the bad policies. What you need to be doing, though, is helping to build up the left block within the Democratic Party, right? Because the reality is that short of an insurrection. And even then, we're dealing with a coalition situation. And so when people talk about, we've got to vote our conscience, what they're discussing is ideology. They're not discussing politics. And do you think some of that ideology is is too rooted in sort of an over-moralizing of everything? Oh, yeah. Moralizing and an absence of a concrete analysis of the U.S. electoral system. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sometimes at worst delusional. Um, sometimes it's for the best intentions and particularly with people that are newer to the movement. Yeah. You know, they, they, you, know, you give them one pass on this. But when people have been around for a while, what it really is, is it's moralistic. It's this idea that voting is like voting on American Idol. Right? That, that there's nothing else at stake except who we happen to like and that we want to express our point of view as opposed to dealing with the reality of politics and, and that our, our politics should not begin or end on election day. They should permeate our lives and some of that is going to be electoral and some of it's not. Now, the other day we were on a meeting together and you had said something that I found interesting because it seemed to dovetail with what I've heard other people on the left say, but a little different from other folks. So there's some people on the left who say, vote Democratic in swing states, 
do whatever you want in the safe states. Right. As I understand it, you were saying something different. You were saying, actually, we should be voting Democratic across the board, both safe states and unsafe states. Correct. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, yeah. Um, fundamentally, I don't believe that there are any safe states. And, um, and it, it's sort of like this famous quote from Malcolm X, when he was uh, talking about, he was being asked about the South and about how bad things were in the South. And he said, the South is everything south of the Canadian border. Um, <laughs> and and I, I, I sort of take that to heart. I don't think that there are safe states. I think that there are more likely states, New York and California, but uh, for the, uh, among the so-called blue states. Um, and, and then there are the so-called red states, like Mississippi, Alabama, right? But things get complicated. Um, what, what I think, it, there's, there's several reasons that I oppose this idea of, of voting your conscience in red or blue states, right? One is that there needs to be in this election an overwhelming repudiation of Trump, not a partial. It has to be overwhelming, and it has to be overwhelming for a few reasons. One is uh, that under no conditions can Trump on election day or the day after say, I'm not really convinced of the election, of the election results. It has to be very definitive. The second is that I don't trust polls. Uh, I mean, once upon a time, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin were safe states. Um, you know, people, when, when people think of safe states, one of the things that happens is that they become a little bit too comfortable. And one of the uh, things that we've seen with the Republicans over the years is that they don't believe that there are safe states. And they engage in all kinds of work in solidly blue states. And part of that is to build up base areas for their later activity. They're very good at that. Um, and I think that we should be doing the same thing in so-called red states. I think we need to be figuring out how do we flip Texas? How do we flip Alabama? You know, what's the coalition that needs to be brought together to win Mississippi? And, and, and so this is not about conscience. This is about long-term strategy. So, uh, so for those reasons, I discourage people for voting for the Green Party, for example, for, uh, for presidents. Um, I think that we need a, a very active left block in the Democratic Party that is going all out to maximize Democratic voters in this election. It seems like one of the conclusions we have to come to as people on the left, it, it seems clear to me, but it's going to be a debate, is that there is no other electoral alternative outside of probably playing within the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. That this, and I think that was, I think that was becoming the dominant view as Bernie was engaged. And I think to some degree, it might, we might have taken a couple steps back with the way that things unfolded in 2020. You know, in other mm -hmm. words, I was hearing a lot of people during the primary saying, hey, this is our party. We need to take this over. This mm -hmm. is our electoral avenue strategically. Mm -hmm. After what happened this time around, I think you have maybe more so the people you mentioned, like first year people who are just getting involved for the first time. I hear it more from them. Mm -hmm. But I'm also hearing it from people who have been around a while. And it's just, it seems like this is a fundamental point that we need to come to some sense of agreement on on the left. That we can't be playing any more fucking games with this. That this just seems, I mean, with what's happening right now with Trump and all this, it's like both this time around and then what are we doing in 22? And what are we doing at the state level in 21 and 23? And how is all that building up to 24? I mean, that's the, the mindset that I think we need to be in. Right. No, that's absolutely right. Now, when I became radicalized, I was uh, also part of the, the, the realm that believed that electoral politics in and of itself was reformist. And that I, I didn't have anything to do with it. I voted. In fact, I voted. I have voted in every election since... Um, I turned 18. 
Um, and uh, the, um, but I didn't believe in engaging in it. And, uh, and over time, I, uh, my views shifted. So in part, it, it shifted in uh, looking at uh, ballot initiatives, the importance of ballot initiatives. But then it started to occur to me that there really was a fight for political power that needed to take place. And, uh, and that to the extent that we on the left hold back from electoral activity, we are, end up always being on a defensive and always subject to someone else that's in power, whether it's a conservative or a centrist Democrat. So my view shifted on that a great deal. The issue of the Democratic Party, because of the history of the Democratic Party, everyone is familiar. And this is why I say to some of my friends who want to vote green or something else, you know, I say, you don't have to tell me about how bad the Democratic Party has been. I know a little bit about history, <laughs> um, right? But the point is this, and this is something that almost none of these folks can come to grips with, that in terms of doing real electoral work, because of the nature of the U.S. electoral system, it is very difficult above the local level to run independent candidacies. Every so often, you'll have something. Jesse Ventura, you know, running in, in Minnesota a few years. But a guy with yeah. money right. and a name. Exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. But even then, it's very, very difficult to run and win. And, and so if you understand the Democratic Party as being a party block as opposed to a real political party, uh, then you see within that that it's a, it's a battlefield. And that's the way we have to look at it. It's a, it's a particular battlefield in the same way that we were battling if there was a labor party and we had a multi-party system, if we had a labor party, there would undoubtedly be a sort of centrist democratic party of some sort. And we would find ourselves repeatedly trying to come to, uh, to terms with them around certain things. You know, who runs in certain races and, and other things. This is the reality of, of, of political work in so-called democratic capitalism. Uh, we're not dealing with a situation where we have won power through some sort of revolution, and we're not close to that. And, and so that's where people have to decide either they want to be involved or not. Now, if they decide they don't want to be involved, my attitude is fine. So then just shut up. Just, just shut up. Right? Don't give us any more justifications or explanations. Just go and do whatever else you want to do, and maybe we can work together. But don't tell me about this, this, this pipe dream, about some sort of third party. And we've got to stop. I mean, I, I really believe that. I don't know why the folks who remain on the left with a certain defeatist attitude even remain here. I really One of the things that's blown my mind over the years is the number of people who have this type of politics, no matter how, and now I'm talking people who have been around for a little while, yeah, and just shit on every single project that comes down the pipeline without, I mean, number one, I'm a very critical person, but I'm always the type of critical person where it's like, I gave you the critique, and now I'm willing to bust my ass to put the work in to also help or to not derail things or to not turn people off from the whole process. A lot of these people on the left with that attitude, it's like, that's our big challenge. You know, when I talk to people on the left, they're like, oh, everybody's so fucking ignorant. I'm like, no, our problem is apathy. Go knock on doors. You go go to these neighborhoods. You go talk to people. They know things are all fucked up. What they don't believe is that if they do anything about it, it's going to change anything. So the last right. thing we need are people on the left just hammering this point home over and over again, which to me just discourages people. I don't know why they remain on the left. I don't know why they write for the left. It's a rant that I don't mean to go, go on, but I mean, it's like, no, it's very important. It, 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 it really blows my mind. I mean, I, I don't, well, has this been the case for a while? Before? Oh yeah. Okay. No, forever. Forever. 
So I think that there's several different factors that you see that looks like it's the same thing, but it's not. So you see some people who are just outright cynical. They've been involved for a long time. They haven't seen things work and they just don't believe anything really will happen. So that's one element. Then there's another element that um, believes that if you demonstrate enough how bad things are, that people will one day wake up and say, damn, you know, Bill has always been telling me about how screwed up things are. Now I see it and now I'm ready to get active. So there's this um, idea that people become activated by loading them with bad news. My experience is that it's exactly the opposite. Then a third element is what I call the surfer's view of revolution. And, and this is the idea that you get on your surfboard and you paddle out, right? You sit there on your surfboard and you basically wait for this massive wave, the great wave of the people, and you ride that in to power. And so, you, and, and the only way you'll be able to ride it in is if you've always been telling people that nothing else will work. So all of these things come together and it, it leads to uh, defeatism. There are people who I will not name who will regularly uh, uh, advance these kind of defeatist arguments as you were describing. And what I finally realized is that there's another thing. They're scared. They're actually scared of winning. And because if you win, then there's a whole new set of complications that arise. And responsibilities. And responsibilities. And it's like, oh, you can't just say what you want to say. Right. Oh, you can't just do what you got to do. It's like now you're in power and you've got this coalition that brought you in, you've got to be paying attention to the different elements of coalition. So you can't just be Bill, Mr. Bill Smartass Fletcher saying whatever I want. I've got to be paying attention to the different groupings that were out there that were responsible for helping me win. And there's many folks, friends of ours on the left, they're not ready for that. They're not, that's not what they want. They'd much rather be the, um, the, 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 the standing there throwing rocks, right. you know, um, as opposed to being directly in and rolling up their sleeves and realizing we have a hell of a job ahead of us. I, perhaps this is the case for everyone. I sure as hell wish that I would have been exposed to your work, people like Jane McAlevey, uh, people like Christian Parenti. Uh, there's a whole number of people who have really, I think, who now I'm 36 years old. And I would say over the last five or six years have really started to come to these conclusions after eight years, you know, from the time I was 21, 22, working on the left, reaching 30, seeing the first Bernie campaign go about, you know, and saying, wait a minute, there's something here. Then I saw what Jacobin was doing. I saw what was happening with the DSA. And it seemed to me that of all the time I had spent on the left with various organizations and movements, that that project, what Jacobin's trying to do, the approach from DSA, that that seemed to make the most strategic sense, and they were some of the most reasonable people that I've encountered. Um, I, you know, you mentioned that it's changed for you over the years. That when you first came in, it was like. You know, I don't want nothing to do with electoralism. I was similar in that way. I, I, you know, my first time I voted for a president was John Kerry. It was an absentee ballot. I was sitting in Western Iraq uh, and sent it in via mail. And I, I was proud of myself because I was surrounded by a bunch of right wing nuts who were calling me a hippie and a piece of shit traitor and all this other stuff. And at the time, I thought I was radical. I'm like, yeah, look, like John Kerry, you know. Yeah. Um, that changed to, I think, some level of cynicism after 06, watching the Democrats take the House and the Senate. And at that time, I was still trying to work with members of Congress uh, through IVAW lobbying and mm -hmm. so forth. And just having member after member tell me, hey, look, we'll oppose the war symbolically. We're not going to cut off funding for the war. 
Now, back then, I didn't realize, like, well, the reason they're not going to do that is because there's not enough pressure in the streets to force them to do that. Right. The conclusion I came to at 22, 23 years old was like, ah, fuck the system, the Democratic Party, they're never going to do anything, all this. Like yourself, I still voted throughout the years, but it took until the last five or six years for me to come to these conclusions. And I think, I mean, one of the things I hope all of us can do is to help bring people up at younger, at an at a earlier point. That in fact, people in high school, college level, as they're young, that the mentors we need to be like putting up on pedestals or the people that we need, whose work we need to be getting out to people are the people who are, you know, thoughtful. I mean, people like yourself, I think people like Jane, these are people who I think we, if more people heard from you guys on the left than others, we'd be in a much better place. Well, I'm, I'm truly honored by that. Um, and flattered. Uh, I would say uh, there's a couple of things that what you're raising uh, brings to mind. So one is that the left is a very complicated place. You mentioned Jacobin and DSA. Uh, there's a number of organizations out there that are trying to do what needs to be done and are uh, attempting to be anti-sectarian and build broad fronts. People need to study these different organizations and decide politically where you fit. Um, and I encourage people to do that. And so that's one thing. The second thing is that it is, how can I put this? In this country, it's difficult being a leftist and being affiliated with an organization. Um, and it's difficult for a particular reason, which is that the uh, so-called mainstream establishment will tolerate individual leftists, particularly out of academia. Um, they are intolerant of organized leftists. And there's a long history to this, going back to the 19th century, that when we get organized, whether you're talking about the CP or you're talking about the Communist Party, you're talking about uh, Maoist, you're talking about DSA, whatever, um, the, the larger establishment is very fearful when we on the left get organized. So when those of us that are affiliated with organizations speak up, we often get slapped down or we never even get the chance to get noted. Um, there's also a kind of, a very interesting kind of elitism that exists within left and progressive circles in the media. Um, if you don't have a PhD after your name right. or a reverend, or um, uh, something similar, um, much harder to get, get attention. And, and I become, it's one thing to not get on ABC News. I get that. But when you're dealing with so-called progressive media and you run up against exactly the same things, that's when it gets really frustrating. Yeah. And, and I think that we've got to take that on. So one of the things I would say to your listeners is that what makes a difference is when you, the listeners, communicate to Democracy Now! or NPR or, or Al Jazeera or whatever and say, um, we're glad that you put different kinds of people on your shows. Now what we want is for you to put on these people that we're talking about we're not getting the same kind of attention. And that does make a difference, man. Yep. I mean, anyone that tells you otherwise is lying. It makes a real difference when these media outlets hear, no, we need to hear from Jane McAlevey. We need to hear, hear from Bill Fletcher, or, you know, yep. whatever. Yep. No, and it, look, I think one of the things that, that we face I just had the conversation with a, a, a mutual friend of ours the other day about this. You know, 
the replication of some of the worst behavior in, in the dominant society and culture sometimes is replicated within the left. And it seems to me that we want, you know, I had seen something that you posted the other day. It made a lot of sense. Regardless of, say, even on the debate within debates that are taking place within the DSA right now. And there's, yeah. there was an article in the New York Times. We don't have to get into it. No, no, let's talk about that. Okay. I mean, we could. I, I wasn't. My interest is not so much about the sort of like dramas within it, but that we need to have open debates on the left and that we can't, yeah. it can't just be. And it's so wild because I, you know, if, if I were to sit you down with any other, say, pick the leftist, 60, 70, 80% agreement. Some of the 10 or 20% may be fundamental, significant disagreement, but that mm-hmm. will eat each other up over that 10%. Like we'll, we'll rip each other's hair out, skin each other alive over that 10 or 15% that we disagree about, even if it's a fundamental disagreement, and yet we stand in solidarity together, we're here, you know, working on right. some of the same issues. I, it, 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 it seems to me that one of the reasons why a lot of people that I know who aren't self-identified leftists don't want to join the left or be a part of these organizations or movements is because they often see some of the same behaviors replicated that these, like, in other words, if you're going to go to a, a shitty job and deal with a shitty boss and shitty management, what in the world would make you want to go to a meeting on a Saturday where you got to deal with a lot of the same internal cultural dynamics that you deal with at your workplace? Exactly. Exactly. Well, let's use that to talk about this whole Adolf Reed controversy. So for your listeners um, that may not be familiar with this, Adolf Reed is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And there was supposed to be a forum that uh, Democratic Socialists of America were having with him. And that's when, after that point, the things become murky. But apparently what happened was that there were people that objected to Adolf speaking uh, by himself and and insisted that he should be there to have a debate. Now, Adolf's views, I've known Adolf for years, Uh, African-American leftist, he's around my age. Um, He is someone who I disagree with repeatedly on issues of race because he tends to in my opinion, downplay the centrality of race in the construction of capitalism and what that means at the level of strategy. Um, So the New York Times had this article, leaving aside all of the the details about the New York Times article. What struck me was that when Adolf apparently decided not to go forward with the forum, it's been described by some as having been canceled. Um, the response by some in DSA was, well, we wanted him to debate and he didn't want to debate. And my response, as you, as you may remember, was like, all right, so what if he did not want to debate in a sense of a formal debate? And, and there's any number of reasons that it seems to me that it'd be completely legitimate for him to say no. For example, Um, When you have someone who has been as controversial as Adolf, um, he could very well have said, I want to make sure I have time to present my argument and I don't have to share my time with someone else, nor be caught in an ambush. I think that's completely legitimate. Listen, there's certain people I will not debate. And one of the reasons is that I think that they're very unprincipled that uh, they, they have attacked me personally. It hasn't just been political differences. And I have no interest in debating. So they might say, well, Fletcher, if you were serious, you'd debate us. And it's like, why? Why would I want to put myself in that? The other thing is that the way I looked at it is if, if Adolf was going to speak by himself, speak solo, so the hell what? There's, if there's question and answer period, there's an opportunity for people to raise their points. Right. It's like we've just we've got to have an environment where we recognize that there's not just one way of doing things. And so if you have a formal debate with them, great. But if you don't, then you raise your objections or points of view from the floor. What is wrong with that? And and so I think you're, you know, it's this kind of self-righteousness 
that exists in many parts of the left that, as you said, drives people away. They say, I don't need this. I get this enough in the rest of the world. How much do you think is the actual format? And so the venue and the format, in other words, I totally understand what you're saying because I've been invited living in Indiana. I've been invited to events where I thought I was just going to be by myself or I thought I was going to this forum and I was going to have X amount of time. Turns out that they stacked the crowd with like 40 or 50 pro-war veterans, whatever the case may be. I've been in some scenarios where I, you know, things very close came to like physical disruption, not just, you know, verbal insults. So I understand that 100%. I've often wondered if the very term, and I know we need to debate, but I think when people think of debates, or when I think of them, even the ones I've seen on the left, it's like, Bill gets five minutes, Joe Blow gets five minutes, Bill gets five minutes, Joe Blow gets another five minutes. Never really having like what I think that we need to have, and I think that might make sense if you were, say, debating Steve Bannon. What right. I don't think that makes sense is if, like, for instance, if there, if someone wanted to facilitate a conversation between you and Adolf Reed, the point is that this is a conversation that we're not right. like, you know, at the end of the day, we're on the same side in so far as like if or when the FBI comes around, they're not going to give a shit whether Adolf or Bill had this view or this view on race. It's going to be you know, are they effective? Do they have influence? Get rid of them. And then are we right. together or what? I mean, I, I more or less think of it as like on the left, we should be having conversations and not yes. to like put Bill down or to put Adolf down or I'm better or this, but to recognize that there's a number of different perspectives and ideas on the left. In some circumstances, some work better than others. Moving forward, we need as many different perspectives, I think, as we as we can get because things change so much. I mean, now I see more and more young people incorporating indigenous identities, indigenous rights into what they're doing. You know, they're like, yeah, we're working with unions. Yes, you know, we have to deal with white supremacy. We have to deal with xenophobia. Oh, and we have to deal with one of the original sins that you mentioned in your article in Jacobin, which is mm -hmm. the genocide of Native people, the displacement mm -hmm. of the First Nations people, you know, these are things that are like changing and morphing over time. So I would like to hear as many of these perspectives as possible. And I, I, all I can say, Bill, is that I plan on doing my best over the years for as long as I have left to try mm -hmm. and build that kind of a left because, and to be as good of a mentor as I can be to younger activists and organizers, because I sure as hell wish that somebody would have pulled my young uh, radical ass aside when I was 25, 26 years old and was like, hey, man, it's not about all this bullshit. I get, and here's the other thing. If you're going to, if you see young leftists doing this, the thing isn't to be like, hey, go fuck yourself. You're an idiot, whatever. It's like pulling people aside. And it's like with the Kamala Harris stuff. When the young, mm -hmm. like people have been around for a while, I'm with you on that. But the people who are younger or this is new to them, I try to speak to their legitimate concerns. Like, I don't try and, you know, I was trying to tell Carl Davidson the other day. It's like, Carl, I get that you want to praise Kamala, but man, you got to recognize there's a ton of people out here who are just holding their nose voting for her. Don't just right. dismiss those people because we want those people to come into the mix. You know, at least like recognize where they could be legitimate or even right. me as a young radical. I wish somebody just would have pulled me aside and said, hey, Vince, a lot of your feelings are legitimate. Here's where you're going wrong, man. Here's, right. you know, here's where you, if you want to be serious about this, here's a better way of going about it. That's right. I, I agree a hundred percent. And that's a lot of what I try to do. I, I spend a lot of my time mentoring and I also spend a lot of my time remembering and remembering what it was like when I was in my late teens and twenties as a young radical and by and large did not have older people to go to. Um, I mean, when I was like 20, older people were like 30, you know, yeah. Yeah. not like 60. Right. And, and, um, and the problem was that there were not enough older radicals around that either felt comfortable talking or um, could dialogue as opposed to giving speeches. There's a word in Spanish and Portuguese, intercambio, dialogue, which I really like. And it speaks to what you were raising before, that we should be having discussions. They can be sharp discussions, 
but discussions that give people the opportunity to elaborate their point of view. And, and those discussions should not be firefights. You know, a few years ago, there was this left-wing publication that described me as the leading voice of opportunism in our era. Now, Vince, why would I have any interest in any further discussion with them? I mean, if you're going to say that, then all right, then let's start talking about each other's mothers. I mean, let's, let's, let's move all this aside and let's just talk about each other's mothers and get down, right? right. But it's like, if the, if the point is that you disagree with me on electoral politics or on Syria or whatever, all right, let's have that discussion. And we may not agree, but that's okay. I think that that's the, that's the approach that I, um, I attempt to encourage. And that means for me, again, there's certain people I'm not going to bother spending my time with. There's about 350 million people in the United States. I figure there's a few people that are dispensable. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. Um, let's, let's finish by talking about this article that you recently wrote with Antonia Darber, uh, in Jacobin. Mm-hmm. It's called Black Lives Matter as part of a global struggle against oppression. Uh, excellent article. Thank you. Um, I'll sort of lay out an overall summary and then I'll just let you get into the details. So really you're sort of laying out historical struggles. You mentioned that it, the original sin is not just the enslavement of African-American peoples, but also the genocide of indigenous peoples. Um, and that within this, that these broader forms of oppression... Um, different forms of oppression overlap different parts of society throughout time. You're really, I liked it because it laid out the history that there's no way to talk about any of these issues without talking about the other ones. Um, That's right. And it seemed clear to me that one of the jabs that you were making maybe towards the end of the article might have been a slight jab at uh, Joe Biden, though I'm not sure if that's true, but it was like, trying to say that like these groups are not homogenous groups. It's not just Latinos who aren't homogenous. It's both black communities, African-American communities. I've had conversations with people about this in the past where I think people find that very helpful uh, to, to make that distinction because so often people say, I think we just had the conversation with Christian yesterday. We were talking with him and he's like, people say like Latino community or, um, uh, community of color. I mean, I come right. from Chicago, man. You say like Latino community. It's like, wait a minute. Are you talking about the Dominicans or the Puerto Ricans? Because in some parts of Chicago, like, you know, there's certain groups, not that it's the whole group, but there's groups that have beefs with each other and they don't necessarily <laughs> identify as a homogenous group. Um, anyway, I'm getting off track. Why don't, no, no. why don't you sort of get into yeah, what what were you guys thinking? I, I'm not familiar with Antonia's yeah. work, but I would like to. Is that a, a female or a male? She's, yeah, Puerto Rican. Yeah. Okay. And um, and is a uh, a leading um, she's in, in a leading uh, person in uh, pedagogy. Um, and I had not met her. I met her through a friend. You gave a good summary of, of, the, of the piece. Um, I, she and I, for different and similar reasons, had been concerned with the way that race has been um, articulated in the, uh, actually beginning back uh, after the Ferguson um, uprising but then more recently after the the responses to the George Floyd murder, that there's been a tendency by the larger media and some elements in the progressive world to return to a racial binary, a black white. And there's also within the African-American movement, some elements, including some very right wing that want to describe the African-American experience with racism, so-called anti-Black racism, as so different, so heinous, so unique, that anybody that lays claims to a parallel racial experience is somehow appropriating our history. And 
as a child of the 60s and 70s, um, this, is, this is an unbelievable occurrence because what I was used to was in the late 60s and early 70s, different social movements gravitating towards the Black Freedom Movement, identifying with the Black Freedom Movement, using many of the same symbols of the Black Freedom Movement, and our attitude was great. This is wonderful, this is flattering, right? Um, but there's been a growth of ethno-nationalism since the 1970s, and, and it's like everyone sort of for themselves, and ethno-nationalism and postmodernism. So what you end up having are these people that basically say um, that, uh, that talking about people of color somehow vanishes uh, African Americans. Or uh, an example a friend of mine, a Chicano friend of mine gave, was that the uh, group of Chicanos and natives, indigenous people went to a Black Lives uh, uh, Matter rally in the Southwest to express solidarity, but also to raise issues around police brutality against indigenous and Chicanos. And they were being told, no, this is not your time. This is our time. So part of what we're trying to do is to point out that racism is not something that is a binary. It's not something exclusive to African-Americans, that there is something called racist oppression that, uh, in which different populations have similar and different experiences. Now, what might get some people really dry, some people crazy, is that the English construction of race did not begin with the enslavement of Africans, but it began with the occupation of Ireland, where in the 1500s, as far as I know, there were no people of African descent. And, but, the, but the English constructed a system based around the idea of the inferiority, the explicit notion of inferiority of the indigenous Irish, so much so that a, a formulation emerged. I encountered it for the first time in 1988 when I went to Northern Ireland called anti-Irish racism. And anti-Irish racism is not about the discrimination that Irish immigrants faced when they came to the United States. It's a very specific phenomena in Northern Ireland and Britain uh, of racializing the people that are indigenous Irish. So what, what Antonia and I wanted to do was to basically say that we have to understand the points in common that we have. Because this also becomes really important at the level of strategy. If you want to win, one of the things you've got to be doing is thinking about who else shares an interest in my winning. Because if you can't come up with an answer, buddy, you're going to lose. And, and so understanding the way that racist oppression works, racism and national oppression, really helps. And that's what we were trying to do in the essay. And one of the things that seems that I think was really helpful in the essay is that you you lay out, here's the context in which this arises. So it's actually not a choice. The way that I'm reading this, and then I'll let you respond. The way I'm reading this is, here's history as it happened. It happened both to the oppression happened to uh, the genocide and, and displacement of indigenous people, the enslavement of, of African American people. Um, and then you extend it beyond U.S. borders. It's like within this project, or actually before that, you talk about then in that context of displacing genocide of indigenous people, enslavement of African-American people, within this context rises the modern forms of policing that we know, That's not right. just as, a, as a, a sort of element of what's happening, but as a central component that both the protection of property and white supremacy are central components to the U.S. imperial project. Um, and that then beyond that, it, it starts to extend beyond, you know, under Polk, we take half, almost close, I think half to half of Mexico in 1848, right. um, Puerto Rico, Cuba, we can go on and on. Um, and that for each of these people, the, and because of, for the sake of time, and I understand how it works, but the group I'm also thinking of, because it's played such a central role in my sort of politic, politicization process has been, um, you know, Muslim communities. I mean, like That's just right. in this last 20 years, it's like, exactly. and, and, 
a group that, you know, we've wor- it's been amazing to me, a lot of the Muslim groups that, that we've worked with over the years, just how quick some of those folks will get, you know, and it's not all of them, so I don't mean to, like, try and stereotype here, but it's been very clear that, like, since 9-11... A lot of the Muslim groups that we've worked with over the years, they see a lot of these things and they're like, yeah, we're with Black Lives Matter or we're with this immigrant rights uh, protest or, the, the, you know, trying to keep kids out of being locked in cages or refugees from being given asylum. Um, what do you think that means for today? And I'll, I'll only add this, this other thing to it. And that is mm-hmm. to bring back, you know, Reed's perspective I think one of the reasons why I found his work interesting over the years was because it was hard to, tr- in, in our area as well, it's been difficult to try and get a community that's predominantly black like Gary, Indiana, to then work with a white sur- suburb that's 10 miles away from Gary, Indiana, but then to work with another city like Hammond, Indiana, that's predominantly Hispanic, Latino. The way to do that it seems, or it seemed to me, though, the way you're describing this makes a lot of sense, try and connect the struggles, but don't talk about them as the same. I guess the way that I was approaching it was what are the sort of class and material concerns that we could get folks to agree upon without having that conversation? So maybe I was trying to avoid what is a necessary and difficult conversation, which is, you know, we'll get there'll be Black Lives Matter activists in the region who are like, look, it's about this issue. It's not about the immigrant community. So then I think to myself, okay, what is the issue or what are the issues that could then bring that group who's dug in ideologically where they're coming from right now with the Black Lives Matter stuff, but with a group who maybe isn't as dug in ideologically, but could see some of that overlap. I don't even know if what I'm saying necessarily makes sense, but that's mm-hmm. kind of how I the, like. That's why I think some of Reed's work will resonate with people because they see how, when different groups have focused so much on like the, their identities and their specific forms of oppression, um, that it often doesn't leave a place for someone to go, hey, you know, or I've heard black activists say, hey, we want um, this white person to understand their complicity in the white supr- the system of white supremacy, and I'm like, look, fucking. Bill works at the goddamn local Circle K. Like, he, you know what I mean? Like, the guy doesn't even have dental insurance and you're trying to talk to him about white privilege? Like, this ain't, you know, this this isn't helpful. So then I think the reaction to that is to go to maybe a position where maybe somebody like Adolph is coming from where you go, okay, wait a minute. Let's just, do you need health care and you need health care? Can we agree on that? Okay, let's work on that. And I think, but you don't ever really get to that that other stuff that you have to get to. And that's always going to be underlying the work that you're doing. So underlying all of this discussion is about class race. And we could discuss this on another program. Race was constructed uh, as a way of justifying the subordination of certain populations and of ensuring social control over laboring classes. That's why it was constructed. Um, It it has no basis in science. It's completely political. And and so that's point number one. Second point is we're not talking demographics. We're talking social movements. So in other words, it's not about this community and that community. It's about people that are in struggle. How do you get people that are in struggle, whether it's around immigrant rights, or around police brutality against African-Americans. How do you get those people that are in struggle to see that they have something in common? And that's where it's not just about, we all agree on certain things. It's understanding how we've been played by the system. And that's where the, the open discussions of race become critical. That, that we've seen too often, the populist movement in the 1890s is a, an example that's often given where people have been brought together on common economic demands. And then when someone says, okay, well, I'm glad we united on this issue, but you know what? There's still this disparity between us and the white folks, and all of a sudden everything blows up, right? If you don't, you can't run away from race. It comes up from behind you. As I like to say, it's the hand from the grave that reaches out and grabs your ankle and refuses to let you leave the graveyard. 
right? It just, that's what it is. And unless you mm-hmm. destroy that hand, you are never leaving the graveyard. And so there's that discussion that we've got to have. But again, it's about social movements. And, and, and part of why Antonio and I wrote this piece was to basically say that these movements among different segments of the Latino, Latina populations around the United States and US African Americans share certain things in common and that there's a basis for solidarity because fundamentally what this is about is how do we win? And that's what I say to some folks that basically get into this, we don't need allies, right? And so I'm basically saying, so essentially you're telling me you just don't want to win. I mean, if that if you don't want to win, let's just that's fine for you to sit off and cry and complain. I'm interested in winning. If we're not talking about winning, I'm gonna go become an entertainment lawyer. And I'll become an entertainer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bill, I appreciate it, man. Thank you very much for your time. You you put okay. everything. I think this was just what we needed. So I Thank appreciate it, man. I really do. Okay. Okay. All Thank right. you very much. Take Look care. Look forward to another one. You too. Bye-bye now. All right. Take care, Bill. You've been watching Park Media. I'm your host today, Vince Emanuele, and we'll talk to you soon. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.